Welcome to the Optimism Cafe, a partnership between the Centre for Optimism, Barrett Consulting and Moral Fairground. The topic today, looking up, looking ahead, winning sales through the pandemic and beyond, with Sue Barrett, Susanna Bevilacqua, Robert Masters and yours truly. Victor Pooh. Welcome to this Optimism Cafe. As the introduction indicates, this is a partnership between the Centre for Optimism, Barrett Consulting and Moral Fairground. In March, when COVID-19 was a problem, but we were not yet in shutdown, Sue Barrett spoke to us about purposeful optimism, sales in the future, how to keep selling during the crisis. Popular demand said we had to ask Sue back, and we've asked her to update us on what's happening in the world of selling and business. As we remain in lockdown, but anticipate the future. Sue is accompanied by Susanna Bevel Aqua, the founder of Moral Fairground. And together, they're going to talk to us about how to find and win sales during the crisis and beyond. How businesses are adapting to the new normal, and to tell us about a new remote program designed specifically to help businesses and people adapt and keep selling during the crisis and beyond. Sue Barrett is a CEO, a strategist, an educator, a writer, an advisor in ethical, sustainable sales strategies, skills and ethos for better business. I've known Sue for decades and each of those titles is true. Susanna, Bevilacqua is the founder of Moral Fairground. Moral Fairground provides a platform that connects businesses, individuals, and communities to create a positive impact in society through running ethical businesses, making ethical lifestyle choices, and staying united to achieve the goal of a fairer and more transparent world. Rob Masters um, is the chairman of the Centre for Optimism, and I would say Australia's lead practitioner uh, of crisis communications and I have the glorious role of COO, the Chief Optimism Officer <laughs> at the Centre for Optimism. So as always, our first question is, what makes you optimistic? Sue Barrett, what makes you optimistic? Okay, well I am optimistic about the ingenuity and solidarity of humans to find better ways to get through a crisis. And uh, I've seen a lot of uh, people doing some amazing things, which I thought I would share with you when we start to look at what sales opportunities are about. But that's what I'm really optimistic about. Susanna, what makes you optimistic? Well, uh, for me, it's all the possibilities, you know, being pushed to look uh, for alternatives way of doing things. Uh, I suppose in the past, I approached this as uh, I didn't have time or to look at uh, new ways of doing things. And now I have no choice, uh, <laughs> but in a good way. And from a personal perspective, I've seen a lot of goodness in people, uh, whether it's uh, the way they interact now um, or just being out and about more and uh, being kinder to each other. And I, I hope that continues. Fantastic. You've nailed it. Robert Masters, what makes you optimistic? Well, I, I think apart from being chair of the, the centre, I, I was reading a book uh, or I am reading a book on uh, Churchill and he, one of his many fa um, famous quotes was that the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity, but the optimist sees opportunity <laughs> in every difficulty. So I think having that quote, it's, it's a good opportunity for uh, both Sue and Susanna to uh, tell us what their, their approach is. So Sue Barrett, last time you talked to us about purposeful optimism and ethical sales, you said that a number of the questions we asked you got your juices flowing and, and you were thinking about new things to do. So how has your thinking developed through this pandemic? Okay, so what's been really interesting, first of all, is when it really hit, you can imagine, everyone's, you know, a lot of people went into that fight flight mode and that's completely understandable. Uh, a lot of their businesses, you know, the, the sales that they had fell off a cliff, many of them, uh, they were faced with, you know, well, what do we do now? And a lot of that was also because the government said to them, look, you have to stop doing business. Uh, so there, there was really 
quite a confronting thing for people. So you can imagine that for a few weeks, they're all going, what, what the hell do we actually do? And in that space, it's very hard to think optimistically. It's very hard to think because you've got to look after your team and you've got to look after the cost and, and things like that. But what's been really interesting is that we're seeing that there's lots of opportunities emerging. So but you've got to actually be able to come out of that fight and flight mode and kind of bunker down mode. And you've got to start looking up and looking ahead. And even if you're a bit scared, you've still got to keep looking up. So I'm finding that there's kind of three, so two types of people that I'm seeing. The early adopters and pragmatists are kind of going, yeah, okay, okay, but we're still going to look up and look ahead. The people who tend to be more sort of change resistant, they're still a bit bunkered down at the moment and maybe just looking up. So I think we've got to sort of encourage people, back to Rob's comment, uh, to see the opportunity in the crisis or in the difficulties. Now, what I've, I remember a great, I found a great saying is that crisis doesn't actually develop character, it reveals character. And I think this is where you start to see those way showers, those forward moving people, those earlier adopters who are really finding things. And I'm going to tell you a story in a moment. I had the privilege of interviewing someone this morning. I've put it on YouTube. It's amazing. So I'll share it as part of all of this later. But I'm noticing that there are three types of businesses or three types of situations businesses can find themselves in. The first is those businesses where it just dried up. It stopped. Okay, and that's when you really have to stare, you know, challenges in the face. And then what could they do to reposition themselves? And of course, we're seeing like restaurants have been doing takeaway or, you know, there's even been like live concerts, you know, they're virtually quite, that whole arts and, and sort of entertainment sector was really hit. But I've actually got a great story about a business that completely reshifted or repivoted themselves. So we've been looking for good news stories around this sort of area. And what came to light, Astrid, who works with me, she found a great uh, story. Now, there's a company called Stage Kings. And I got to interview the MD, Jeremy Fleming, this morning. So just bear with me because it's such a great story. I want to share it with you. Basically, Stage King specializes in creating incredible and truly unique structures for some of the country's largest and most renowned events and festivals. You know, like the Globe Theatre, they build that. They do lots of work in stadiums and events. They were building the stage for the Marley Cyrus concert at the Grand Prix. And on the 13th of March, Friday, the 13th of March, Scott Morrison said, you can't have crowds more than 500 people. Their business, which was doing all of these live big events, basically shut down that day. 56 people around the country doing, working on projects, no more work. They were, they're brilliant at what they do, but their whole industry shut. So for the next week, they were trying to work out what to do. Because what I like about this story, and I think, you know, who has a spare $2 million floating around that you could just start up a whole new business? Most of us don't. And most businesses are small businesses. So what they did was they looked at their talent and their skill. They had carpenters, they had metal workers, and they had design people who would do these amazing bespoke things in, in events. One of their, uh, he talked to a mate in um, Ireland and this guy said, oh, look, you know, we've had this happen too, but we're thinking about making furniture. And it just so happened the operations manager of this company, Stage Kings, designs furniture in his spare time. And they saw there was a bit of a drought for home office desks because guess what the rest of us are having to do? Work from home. So on the Sunday, uh, they uh, did some designs. Uh, that's the 22nd of March. Did some designs. Uh, went and built them the next day. Thought these looked nice. Made a commercial website. So they're going from B to B now to B to C. And then they promoted these desks out there to the marketplace. So let me just give you a bit of statistics here. They were able to re-employ all their 56 people. They have actually got 4,000 orders for home office desks, standing and sitting desks, and a few other bits and pieces. And they've also been able to donate nearly $22,000 back to the entertainment industry to try and help, of course, those people who may not be. I think that is one of the best stories I have ever heard. So 
this business has clearly gone from what they do here to a completely different market. But what they've done cleverly is they've looked at what have we got resource wise? What have we got talent wise? How do we actually reposition that to do something else? So that's an example of a business completely pivoting, not just doing takeaway out of a restaurant, which is fine, but this is a real game changer. Anyway, I just think it's a wonderful story to share. The other two things quickly is that there are businesses that have already been doing stuff before COVID that may have been a bit more fringe, but with COVID, the conditions now make what they do relevant. So I just think Zoom is an example, right? That's now just taken off. And if I can use my own business as an example, we've been offering remote education and learning in sales for a number of years, but it's not been traditional, but now it's becoming mainstream. And so this is the thing that you've got some businesses that have already been doing stuff and then the conditions create a surge in what they can do. And then finally, you've got businesses whose supply chains are intact, so they actually can still operate. But here's the lesson. If you don't have a good sales system in place, good sales people, good strategy, you can still get into trouble. So here's an example. One of my clients who we've been working with for a, number, a couple of years now, they are in a marketplace that's doing pretty well. They have had increases in sales of 70% in March, 30% in April. They've been able to bring on a whole lot of new clients. Their sales year to date are up 12%, yet their competitors are minus 30%. So whether it's a complete reshaping of your business, whether it's a bringing on something that was in the fringe and now it can become mainstream, or whether you can still stay in business, it doesn't matter. You've got to have good business, good sales, good strategy, good people, good resources to be able to take advantage of the opportunities that are out there. So I hope that kind of gives people something to think about when, and this is what's been on my mind is that you've got to be looking up and looking ahead because there's so much stuff out there if you can actually start to really see it beyond the anxiety that we, of course, often are feeling in, under these circumstances. Well, that's brilliant, Sue. Um, so, if people are talking about the new normal. Um, Robert Masters has coined the phrase the better normal. Uh, there are, Germany has now started to open up business. Um, France as well, we're here, the US is starting to move to open up and there are rumours that we'll even be opening up here in Melbourne. Um, what's changed? What, what, have, what have people got to do? We, just, just filling you in, we did a survey on global strategy, which we got the results last week. Um, nearly 400 strategy professionals from 16 countries. 80% um, of them thought strategy should be optimistic. 60% had been in optimistic strategy only 20% measure optimism, and even then they're not sure. But everyone was had their strategies in review. So paint us the picture for the company coming out of lockdown. What's new and what's in your expertise, Sue? What do they do to sell themselves to the world? What they've got to be able to do is... Uh... Business strategy is studied, but sales strategy is very poorly understood and rarely mm. studied. This is the area that we want to raise people's awareness about and be actually able to look at as you, you know, if you don't know where you're going, every road will lead you nowhere. You cannot go splat. And in this case here, you've got to be laser like in your opportunity. So what we want to be able to do is teach people how to do sales strategy. And that means it's a much more tactical approach. So just like um, Stage Kings with now ISO King, their, their desk business, they had to really look at a targeted market approach as to what they're doing. Now, whether that's a long-term thing that they can hold on to or it's just to get them through this tough time, again, you've got to be adaptive. So we want to teach people how to do market segmentation. People need to know how to actually look at, um, you know, micro-segmentation. So it's not just a, here I've built this, do you want it? It's about who should I be talking to? How should I be talking to them? What are they looking for? And this is where you want to take your sales strategy down to this particular level. So if we can teach people how to do that, then their businesses will be much more adaptive in the future and they'll actually be able to pivot and shift quickly and know how to take things further. So we've built, for example, a uh, what we call MAM, and it's a market, um, it, it basically helps you look at what you currently sell to who to your current market. 
Can you take that to a new market? Do you need to adapt new products and so on and so forth? This is basic strategy, but at a sales level. Mm -hmm. And then how you pivot quickly to move those things forward. So I think this is a big area, a big gap uh, that people don't understand sales strategy, market segmentation, and how to execute that properly. And that's when you start looking there, that's when opportunities really emerge and uh, you can really take advantage of them. Oh, I could, wish we could bottle that. That was just, I think it's expressed everything we need to think about. So Susanna, tell us more about Moral Fairground. You know, where did it come from? What does it do? I started Moral Fairground uh, 10 years ago and it was a result of... Um, you know, traveling around the world, uh, seeing a lot of disparity um, and visiting countries where they didn't have the same rights, uh, people were disadvantaged. And every time I traveled, it just, it just didn't seem to shift and change. And I understood that it's the way that we consume, uh, the, way, um, the way we, um, you know, if, even the way we travel, the way we consume, the way we use our product and services has an impact on society, not just locally, but globally. And so I wanted to make a difference and we created Moral Fairground to connect uh, people, uh, communities and businesses to encourage engagement and action that create positive impact. Um, we do this by uh, putting together events uh, of different sorts, bringing people together that aspire to have the discussion around how can we change a world for a better conversation, better outcomes for all. And so some of the events that we run are, you know, festival free, free public events um, for the general public, conferences. Um, we celebrate the achievements of other ethical enterprises by running awards, uh, as well as networking events. And just recently uh, started delivering some workshops uh, to support the endeavours of the ethical enterprise during this time. So that's, uh, that's moral fairground. <laughs> so COVID-19, we've, we've seen some people thrive. Yesterday, we did a, an event with Dementia Australia. Um, and, you know, for people, um, caring for people with dementia and the like, it's been an incredible change in lifestyle to go from visiting your spouse every day to 10 minutes twice a week. So we've seen astonishing changes in many of these for purpose, not for profits. So what have you seen? Who have been the, the stars in adaption? Who have been the people who failed? What's been the secret source of getting through this crisis period? So I can sort of tackle that from two different things. You know, if you look at it, something like, um, like our uh, business, for example, uh, what we do is what we do, but we do it through running events and generally it's in-person events. And obviously when the restrictions happened and were announced, um, we were one of those industry where we had to shut down. <laughs> Otherwise we'll be illegally doing things illegally. Um, so we had to sort of look at how else can we still keep on engaging people and communities and, and diversify. So bringing our events online and looking at other opportunities there to partner up with other groups to do that. Then when you look at some of the other enterprises that we uh, normally work with, um, you know, it could be a social enterprise or an ethical business, that, that have been deeply impacted um, because when you think of a social enterprise uh, that exists for the benefit of the community to drive social and environmental change and providing an opportunity for the most disadvantaged in our community, you know, when you look at that cafe, for example, that was employing uh, people at risk or youth at risk uh, or people with disability and it's no longer operating, um, those people are already disadvantaged. <laughs> You're closing a business like that, they're going to be even worse off. And, 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 and in the bigger picture, it had social implication beyond what's happening now. But some of those have, have, have sort of come out of it by, um, I think, uh, when you look at um, organisations coming together um, to deliver, uh, Street is doing something to do with uh, providing food for, um, for people. Uh, disadvantaged people. Others have come up and created other online events and programs. So people have been proactive, but it is about the, I suppose, the 
what they have, ac uh, the access they have to, to things. Not, not every organisation is big enough to be able to, to do that. Uh, but I, I think it has provided a lot of opportunities for a lot of business people. I'll be looking and thinking. I think it's still got a long way to go. Uh, I think some people are still uh, deciding how to, to, to navigate through that. So Sue and, and Susanna, you've come up with some new innovation in partnership to um, very ethical businesses. Do you want to tell us what, what this next stage of development is? Well, um, Susanna mentioned that she's starting to partner up. So because of the community that she works with, uh, and also to a lot of people have a bit of a few issues around the word selling. They kind of feel like it doesn't have, well, it, we know it can have a bad reputation. But what we want to do is raise people's awareness about what good selling looks like, good strategy, good process, how you actually can, you know, keep your business flowing. Because businesses don't have a health issue. They have a sales and revenue issue. Yeah. So we've partnered together to create a remote program, which is a combination of four live uh, webinars um, underpinned by uh, online tools and resources and templates and things that people can do to put their business through that to do the thinking about where those opportunities lie. Because like I said, most people don't do strategy properly, particularly sales strategy. So we have a whole range of processes so what Susanna and I have done is we've pulled this together. We're launching it next week and we're going to be inviting people to participate, to put their business through this filtering system so that they can see opportunity, put their head up, look out, but not just go oh, over there, but with precision so that they've got laser like decision making and make informed decisions about how to reorganize their assets and efforts to go after opportunity. Just like, you know, these guys did, they made furniture. It was very narrow market but they knew what they could do. And they, I tell you what, they took advantage of the fact that Ikea, you know, the other uh, office works and stuff like that had all run out of desks and their supply chains were all overseas. And there was something like between six to 10 weeks waiting for desks to come in. They can turn a desk around in a day. Now that's an advantage that they have. Now, whether it's a long-term advantage, or it's just for the opportunity, it's still an opportunity and it keeps their businesses employed. So if we can teach people how to think like that and how to organize themselves without the $2 million sitting in the background, you know, with the comfy slipper zone, but get them thinking like that, that's what we want to do for social enterprises, for not-for-profits, you know, for any business that wants to do good work out there in the community and stay in business for all the right reasons and keep people in jobs. That's what we've got together to do, to teach people and help them navigate their way through that. But unless you stop and look at your business, you can't do that. So that's why it's really thrilling, you know, for what we, you know, and what I really like the most about when I first met Susanna and then we decided to do this is that like we decided in five minutes done. We share, we share such common ground and it's just we bring areas of expertise together and it made it just so easy to pull this together. And, and the funds go, I think, um, to these for-purpose activities, don't they? Mm. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I just want to make a comment that, you know, uh, Sue is right. We often sort of funnel, uh, have a funnel view of what we do. Uh, and things like this sort of make you look at who are your networks, who are your collaborator. And it's important more than ever now to collaborate I think that's a very positive thing uh, and it benefits multiple people rather than just your immediate um, business or yourself. So I, I see a world of opportunities and um, I'm glad we're doing this amazing workshop together because I can see that when you're in that situation that, you, you know, you've been doing something for a long time and suddenly it stops. You can't, you can't see, you can't navigate through how, how else you can change. So, um, yes, uh, it, it's going to be a really, really worthwhile uh, workshop for everyone to attend. Rob Masters had some very good questions to ask uh, the two Sues, Sue and Susanna, about leadership, uh, strategy. It's over to you, Rob. Thanks, Victor. Um, just, just listening to you, um, You've, you've gone down into the bowels of how these companies should uh, actually try and turn themselves around. But one of the things that I've often found is leadership and the role of leadership in actually doing that turnaround. And I was privy to hear uh, or have an opportunity to hear some research that they've gone into leadership and it was 
principally around three things, accountability, responsibility, and responsiveness. So I was just wondering in your strategic work and how you're going about that, how do you see leadership playing a role uh, in, the, in what you're actually doing? Um, it's, it's vital. Um, in the online content that we've created, one of the key topics is all around leadership. And it's around how you communicate. It's around the clarity. Um, there's so many elements that go with it. So we're creating these checklists for people in there. But ultimately, at the end of the day, what is our purpose? I believe as a leader, I have a duty of care to, to make sure that I create a future for my team. Um, I have a duty of care to make sure that what we do take to market is really useful for other mm. people and that we all feel like it's contributing something to a better world. So I think that um, as leaders, it's very hard because we're all feeling stressed too. I mean, but um, it's, it's how you actually hold that plumb line together, that true north about what we're standing for, the clarity, don't overcomplicate it, but do invite people to participate in that future. It's not just you having to come up with it all the time. I think sometimes we forget, you know, that our, our, anyone can be a leader. They can be a leader of an initiative, an idea, go off and do something. But we have got to be the stewards. I prefer stewardship in this, in this situation, in, in all situations, to be fair. We've got to be stewards. And that's why we don't always have to be the loudest voice, but we have to hold tight to what we're aiming to do as leaders to help our teams drive forward with purpose and clarity and vision and camaraderie and collegiality. And that, you know, we're here to help each other and find opportunity to support each other moving forward and our customers and our suppliers. In fact, actually, there's really interesting work that says whilst there are some companies out there that are doing okay, uh, it's been indicated that, that they should show leadership to perhaps uh, p businesses that are smaller or weaker than them who don't have like, the, the, the cash reserves. Because if those businesses in their supply chain go out of business, it makes it much harder to restart again. So it's not just leadership of your business, I believe, it's the leadership of your domain of your areas of expertise. And if we can show good stewardship and leadership and care for each other and keep that that interconnected web of what we do going forward, then that benefits community. Uh, people can stay in jobs and we can have good business. Yes, we have to adjust things and adapt, but I do think it's beyond just your own business and your own bottom line. Well, that, that's very interesting. So in, um, in this book um, on Churchill, that was one of the things that he was talking about engaging and how to bring the broader community into the conversation. And Susanna, you must find that in, in your work. How do you find from a community base, um, uh, this element of leadership or stewardship as Sue was saying and inclusion? I think more than ever now, we need um, inspirational leaders. Uh, we need that positive uh, vision and we need everyone to bring everyone together. Like I said, that collaboration. Uh, yes, you can be a major corporate, uh, but like Sue said, how do you, how do you demonstrate leadership by helping maybe um, the smaller businesses that you work with? In the community, how do we work together as community? Um, the, the, in, the inspiration bit is really necessary uh, because with the current situation, it's not just going to stop tomorrow when things go back to normal. It's going to go for much more longer. And we need to keep uh, remembering that a positive attitude um, flows down, has an effect, uh, and also allowing uh, the voices of people that maybe we uh, didn't hear before uh, to express and see what they had to say on on. On, on this and to move forward. And that, that brings me into strategy, uh, Sue, in particular, in bringing voices in. How, how do you find the development of a strategy in the direction in which you're going from the, the selling or the sales point of view? Um, is, it, is that a collaborative approach to it or how, how are you actually forging that strategy? Mm, that's a good question because um, 
because it's such a complex variable system and there's lots of signals out there, I do like to, we do like to include people, the, you know, like the, the hive mentality, the people's ideas. If you've got people out interfacing with customers, so for example, um, one of the banks has just had all of their business banking specialists call every single customer, okay? Now, in calling every single customer to see how they're going, not just as a care call, you pick up on a whole lot of information that, may inf that will inform you as to which way things are going. So to me, every client call that you make is a market research call. But you've got to come back to say, okay, what are we good at doing? What can we, how do we serve the market? What are we seeing as developing markets, you know, uh, competitive markets, mature markets and declining markets? Where do we want to be? So you've got to get feedback from your people um, and then you've got to obviously pull it together in such a way and choose what you're going to go after, not just go splat. You've got to go laser. But uh, including people in the contribution, now it depends how big your company is. If you've got thousands of people, that makes it very awkward. But you can use surveys and insights and information to gather information from people that will inform you as to what's vibrating out there. What, what's, what's happening out there because a sales strategy is much more tactical than an overarching, you know, five, 10 years. I don't even think we can do five, 10 year strategies at the moment. We've got mm -hmm. to come back to, and that's why sales strategy is much more adaptive. You pivot, you adjust, you try stuff out, and then you look at what threads are coming through to help you navigate forward. But I come back to stewardship. CEO, the sales leader, those people must make sure that they don't just stop and start, that they really do the analysis and then go after it with clarity and purpose and enable their people to follow through on that and support them and serve their customers. So it's a team sport, basically. And it's adaptive, it'll, it'll adjust and keep adapting, kind of like this wiggly line as we, we, we yeah. work our way through. And Susanna, with strategy with you, is, is, that, is that bringing the community into your strategic thinking in the initial place or is it more that you're developing the the uh, ideas and the, the approaches within your own background and knowledge? How, how do you go about it? Well, we develop ideas within, you know, our own knowledge, but we do go out to community as well and, and collaborate with other people. We don't just say, because we don't know everything. <laughs> we, we facilitate things. So we need to work with our communities to bring things to light. But I also want to say that with strategy, I think it's very important right now for whatever we learn now to use that in any future strategy and keep that because uh, I think it will be for the benefit of uh, even when it goes back to normal, we'll be able to do things that uh, we're doing now, even in the normality. So have possibly two, even, you know, two different avenues of, of doing business that we perhaps didn't uh, look at before. So, yes. Very good, very good. Uh, I think it, it, I find this, this subject most interesting because everyone's, uh, well, I, I won't say survival, but there is a certain... Mm -hmm. um, that word is being branded about a lot these days about survival and the approach and people need some direction and, and both of you are providing that across the board. So it's excellent. Thank Victor, you. I see there's a number of questions there. So, And Rosemary's joined us uh, on the panel to ask one of those questions. So Rosemary, um, you, you work in the nonprofit space. What would you like to share? I've always worked in the for-purpose, not-profit space. Um, and it, it was interesting to, to hear both the, the ladies talking about the not-for-profit area because it's, it's, it's so often not just overlooked, but it's undervalued. Mm -hmm. And when, when you undervalue something, you actually detract not from it, but you detract from the wider community. And that's something that I think we, we forget that uh, without the community underpinning everything, then we are all lesser people for it. So you know, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in what they were talking about simply because it's like, there's always something new to learn. Um, and I think you know, it's, it's, it's something that we all need to, to share in. Rosemary, if I can just say, um, I have always lived my life by the philosophy that everybody lives by selling something. 
and that we've all got ideas and initiatives and things to share. And um, it's just the S word has such negative connotations that people think it's some sort of, you know, con man or grifter or whatever. But it's not that, you know, selling is just this enabling opportunity. How do we get not-for-profits? How do we get all sorts of businesses to make their competencies visible to the people that need to know about them? That's a proactive approach. That's an a we need to have agency around that and feel proud about what we're doing. And so um, that's how I look at life. To me, great sales skills are vital life skills. Whether it's me going for a job, you know, us taking a not-for-profit to market, how do we proactively position those so that people know about us because if we're not capturing share of mind first, we cannot capture share of wallet afterwards. So how do we position ourselves effectively out there for all the right reasons in the most ethical manner possible? And if I can just add a comment that uh, Rosemary, the not-for-profits now are vital for the benefit of the community. Um, so it is time to shine and um, you know sh share what you're doing and go out in the world because it's, it's gonna be very important after this to have all that support that those not-for-profit organisations provide. Yeah. I think, uh, Jens, you wanted to um, add uh, something to the conversation. Yes, look, I, I, first of all, I totally agree that um, it is critical, this, this using the S word, using selling, because, you know, we, off, we work in business to business mostly, and it's, it's not that I'm in trouble selling my stuff, it's that my clients are in trouble as well. So selling and, 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 and buying is, is, is vital for both sides, even more so in this, in this times. So um, I think it's, it's critical that you understand that selling is not just about, you know, making some money, but it's about helping both of us to stay in business and, 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 and to, to continue doing business with each other mm -hmm. and I think that's that's a very important thing and a very optimistic view from my point of view on selling that we may be able to cultivate a bit more in these in these difficult times. We've got uh, Amanda Knowles joining us from France and I think you wanted to um, uh, respond to Rob's point about uh, innovators and different people coming to invent and think differently and um, you've uh, assembled the Professional Women's Network in the southwest of France and you've revitalised that. So you've got uh, some really great insights to share. Well, so what, what the Rob reminded me of was, it was a great book that I read recently and it was called um, Churchill's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare and the Mavericks Who Plotted Hitler's Defeat. And it was all about this absolutely wild group of people that he brought together um, to invent stuff and do warfare differently. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, everything from inventing how to create this, this, this round thing to stick on the side of submarines and then the divers could swim away or, you know, infiltrating the Renault factory so the Germans wouldn't have tires. So it's just like all these completely off the wall, different ways of thinking about things um, that really made a difference. And um, so I thought, Rob, you might enjoy that book. But um, I think the core of it was it was about different people coming together to invent, to think differently. So in this situation, who, who, who do you see as the inventors, the innovators, sorry, and, and why? Why are some people moving very quickly from, oh my God, what happened, to let's innovate? I, I think I'll, I'll let Sue, um... Uh, answer that, but, but just from a leadership uh, uh, point of view, I think leadership or stewardship as the uh, term Sue uses is important in this area because when you start to move into the science area and Sue's got a background in science and that, you're seeing a number of people actually come to the fore in a whole range of areas. Um, and I find that quite fascinating that science now has taken on a, a whole new chapter um, in the way people understand science, listen to scientists, and what they're actually proposing and how they, their work has got to be uh, incorporated into the bigger business world and society as a, as a whole in functioning. So just in that area alone, science, I think, has come to the fore, but that's not to I move away from many of the other areas. You know, politicians are moving a lot further into um, being innovative in the way they're actually communicating uh, from that point of view. And business leaders, they've had to, you know, as soon as just said, they've had to adapt new ways and they have their whole workforce 
go out and phone customers and ask what customers are thinking or saying that we're here for you is a new way of thinking from everyone's point of view. So uh, I think as Susanna said, I, I really would hope that this chapter in our lives is not forgotten, but is used um, as part and parcel of the strategies uh, for the future. But I'll, I'll let Sue have a, a thought, given her background in both the sales area and um, the sciences area. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Um, what I think is very interesting here is that in business for the last 40 years, it's been a bit linear. It's been very about profit maximization and shareholder return, which I think has actually dulled people and got them, you know, not really looking at what's possible. With all of this social upheaval and business upheaval, um, there's so many different ways that we could look at things. So I think that what I said when I said I was optimistic at the beginning is about human ingenuity. But you've got to get your voices heard and it's got to be something that uh, it can help people adapt and move forward or find new pathways forward. So we have to create forums and opportunities where ideas can be heard and different ways of doing things can be heard. Now that's gonna upset some people whose power and status will be threatened by this. Mm. The way we've been doing it for the last 40 years, they're not gonna like this at all, but we have a people movement now. We have a lot of people out there who are very clever and very capable and can see different ways of running societies. For example, Amsterdam is now going to inculcate donut economics as their way to run Amsterdam, which is very different from running the more linear GDP kind of growth scenario. And I love that. I think it's gonna be great to see that kind of experiment, but we've got to stop being frightened of change. And we've also got to open up uh, doors and pathways and opportunities for different voices to come in, different voices that bring different perspectives, whether it's from disability perspective, whether it's diversity, culture perspective, or scientific endeavor. But ultimately at the end of the day, to me, the core to all of this is our common good. Mm. How do we run healthier you know, environments and businesses and societies where more people can flourish? And when you, if you start with that as the epicenter, oh my God, there are so many things already. We don't have to invent anything new. We've got it all. We've got a huge Lego box for human. We have. We can reassess this, whether it's cleaner environments and all sorts of things. So my advice to everyone is always to read widely and to, you know, and, 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 and really utilise that base quality that all humans have, which is curiosity. Mm. Some of us have actually shut that down a bit. Others of us just never stop. I keep being, you know, I think too much and all of that. But our curiosity, our collaboration, our cooperation and common ground will find us the pathways forward. But don't be fooled. The people with status and power, they're being threatened at the moment. So we have to find safer spaces for this stuff to happen and be brave and courageous to try new stuff moving forward. I have no doubt that we have all the ingenuity and capability to create a much better world. And there's so much opportunity. And I'm really optimistic about that. But I'm also just cautious about how it might uh, come across to some people and what they might do to try and, you know, dampen that down. But I'm never going to give up, just so you know. <laughs> we had John Hagel from uh, Silicon Valley on last week. And uh, one of his key themes is the passion of the explorer. Mm. You know, this notion yeah. of curiosity, and particularly curiosity is the underpinning of optimism. Mm. You know, this, this, this finding the better answer. Jens, I think you wanted to add some perspective to that? Yes, happy to. So first of all, Amanda, I think from a German perspective, I really need to book, read that book from Churchill. From, from a sales perspective, it doesn't really surprise me that, um, that these are happening, you know, despite all the suffering and the pain that people have to endure, whether it's in, in, in war or in, in an epidemic like now. From a sales perspective, I'm looking at it from the, from the, from the angle that, you know, when, when everybody is there and, and having products and, and everybody has everything, it's really hard for me as a salesperson to find that niche, that spot where I can shine, where I can make a difference, where I can stand out. Um, now, with everything being disrupted, all of a sudden, there is all these cracks and breaks that I can venture into and find new opportunities, new angles. And... and, and Myself, I've been through a similar, uh, similar journey back when I started in the late 80s in banking. And that was just before in Germany, the wall came down. 
and obviously East Germany didn't have anything similar to the to the West German banking system. So for us young bankers, the motto was young bankers go east, and it was just an open market where you could immediately flourish and grow as a, in, in your profession. So. It, at the time for us it was a no-brainer and i believe amanda there are people a lot of people out there who are just waiting for these opportunities to when everything is a bit messed up and 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 all of a sudden there's all these new opportunities and and as, as sue was saying if you can overcome your fear and and the and the initial anxiety of, of oh my gosh things are changing then i think it's it's i'd rather say it's it's actually easier for a lot of people under these circumstances to be creative and and find new things to do so sue i'd like to come back to your core mission of purposeful optimism you know martin seligman the you know the lead the guru of positive psychology in his first big commercial research project showed that the optimistic salesman sells a multiple compared to the pessimist so Where's purposeful optimism in this new normal or the better normal, as Robert Masters says? Mm. Well, I think it's probably worth to, to looking at the fact that um, you've got opportunity and op optimism, but if you aren't focused, if you don't know where you're going, every road will lead you nowhere. So what we have to do, coming back to, well, what are my talents and capabilities? What can I do now? Where are the opportunities or the cracks, as Jens pointed out, and those sorts of things? And how do I direct my efforts moving forward in a purposeful manner? So to me, purposeful optimism is strategy-led optimism. It's got, a, it's got a focus. It's helping us look forward what we can do. Uh, it's not scattergun. Uh, it's something that can be inculcated across the whole organisation and actually feed into how we operate and execute what we want to do moving forward. That's how I would define our purposeful optimism from the top down all the way through. Everyone knows what they're doing purposely, but we're looking at what we can do and there's great opportunity to be unearthed and, and worked on and cultivated. When we did our global survey on optimism, you'll be pleased to hear that purposeful optimism resonated with 30% of optimists. So great. it's a uh, pretty powerful Vincenzo. Um, joined us on the panel before we started with a beautiful cat, but it's disappeared from his <laughs> shoulder. But Vincenzo, you wanted to ask uh, and make a good point about supply chains in the new normal. Yes, yes. Uh, this is um, um, coming back to the beginning of the, um, uh, the, the, the webinar when we touched on the ISO King experience, which is remarkable. Uh, which is to, uh, uh, by the way, Sue, I saw the video this morning and it was a great one uh, and I like it. But m what, what I was thinking is the experience uh, in that case is some experience that tell us that there was a gap uh, made um, uh, available by the, cri by the crisis and re re uh, um, engineering your capability, uh, the guys make, make, made happen to fill that gap. But really, the, it was a really not a new opportunity in terms of something new coming up from from this crisis. It's kind uh, it's not a it's kind of fill the gap situation. Okay, there was a gap, and it, it was able to shift it, the way it was uh, uh, working and and manufacture the solution, the product to 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 fill the gap. But my question is, is this disruption, this is COVID-19 disruptions bringing us the opportunity to really develop a new market where uh, a fair purpose uh, economy and uh, uh, economy, a common good economy will be possible to achieve or not? Is, is there an opportunity now? Are we doing enough in order to make it happen? Is there a market or a market needs to be built? Susanna, do you want to address this? Uh, yes. I think uh, with any crisis, and we've seen that in 2009 with the global financial crisis, straight after that, an array of social enterprises, business we've been backed, sort of started rising. Uh, they wanted to have a voice uh, and make a difference because they were not happy with what was happening. We'll see the same thing here. I think... I think we've got to take that opportunity now as a business with impact, as an ethical business, to say this is this is that this has to be the new norm. Uh, we have to reframe the way we see business. I think there is a great opportunity. 
um, and talking about that, filling that gap. I, I think there's nothing wrong with that because potentially some of those business with purposes uh, will have the opportunity to fill with the gap. And so I think, I think that's, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. We, we should embrace that. Uh, and, uh, and even make it part of the the new business model. Uh, like I said, you know, when you when you the strategy, when you're revisiting your strategy, don't just leave what you've learned now, but move it forward. I think there's a great opportunity for business with impact uh, to to rise right now if we come together as a community. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Centre for Optimism doubled its membership in April, so I think there's a a real yearning. <laughs> Paul Hearn, you wanted to, to, to share in the conversation. Oh, thanks for that, guys. Um, yeah, I'm an optimistic sort of uh, character. Um, and we, we do, we're a lighting manufacturer locally here in Australia, in Melbourne. And we've always done commercial lighting and find, found it very hard for a long time, of course. But then we started thinking about all this globalisation and shipping things everywhere. And we started a um, 3D printing section of our company in lights, only lights. And our idea, thoughts were not to ship um, product around, but IP of how to build things and how to do it like a franchise and that. Are people going to start doing more localised manufacturing now? Well, it's about risk management. And it's about uh, availability of resources. And um, there was a not so optimistic article uh, about uh, how much, you know, we've actually got in terms of uh, like whether it's fuel or chemicals available or that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. this just in, I think what's going to be disrupted is the just in time approach. Yeah. And I think that's going to actually be changed. But then you've got 3D printing, like you say, that you could actually do something on site. And we've, we in our sales trends report that we released at the beginning of the year, one of the things was also about potentially, you know, with, say, phones and stuff like that, that you could actually customise and have your own phone built locally in your area through this kind of 3D technology. Mm. So there's stuff coming where we may, in fact, be able to short change the supply chain but you've got to have resources and things available. So it is actually putting a lot of people on notice, Australia, uh, in terms of what it's got, ac what it's got um, access to now. And if something just completely shut down, you couldn't get it, what yeah. do we do? But back turning last century, turn at the turn of last century, Australia was the most inventive place in the world. It was incredible because of our isolation. We worked out how to sort stuff out and made amazing things. So... Again, back to ingenuity of humans. Um, we've got to look at what stocks and supplies we need available. We've got to manage the risk around that. But I think it'll be very interesting to see that you may find diversification of supply around the world rather than a concentrated effort like maybe we've had with China. It doesn't mean things won't come out of China, but it will actually be put into question how we manage risk and then distribute the risk accordingly. I know in America, um, so... Um, and picking up on what um, Vincenzo was saying, that whole supply chain is totally under review and the governments are now looking at, they will not give loans if your material and your, uh, as in uh, materials and your labour is overseas. Mm -hmm. So there's a bigger focus now on local manufacturing. And I think the federal government will start to look at that um, as, as some of the new ways of Australian develop, uh, development as far as the manufacturing sector is concerned. Um, so they were, the Americans talking to me were saying that whole supply chain is going to get, have a big disrupt, disruption um, in this post-COVID um, period. Look, uh, last, um, last person I'll invite to, to say something before we do our round off. Sam Jewell sent me an email this morning to say that she has produced a new soap product um, from uh, the waste uh, on her country property. So. No, 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 no. No, no, I didn't. I said, I said it's from wild camels in ah. the, the feral camels of the desert, regreening the desert with the camels they were culling. There was 1.2 million of them they culled to. 300,000 and there's a big project that is now regreening the desert. I was working with some satellite people to try and do 
proof of concept with carbon sequestration over large areas, but it was just it got a bit all too, bit too complex. But yeah, no, I've produced a small camel fat soap with organic oils as well mixed in. And in this time of washing hands, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's a beautiful soap. And I'm, I know a lot of people want plant oils, but we've, we've got to think about how vital the animals are in our ecosystems and the providing of that diversity. So I, 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 I made the soap, some, I started the project sometime last year to sell in person to be able to talk about the land. And then we shut down in person. <laughs> now I've got them on my desk and I'm going, oh, it's too much with the postage. So <laughs> anyway, if people are, you know, happy to pay a bit of postage on them, they're, I'm selling small amounts of them to really as a talking piece this is the main reason I'm selling them. Mm. And it, wonderful, so. wonderful final story and it answers this question of local manufacturing. So the hour has come. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists, starting with my chairman, um, thinking about the pandemic and the story you're going to tell um, generations to come, um, what is your keepsake from living through the pandemic? Well, from, from the chair's point of view, I think um, these sessions that the centre is holding, because uh, they're, they're, a, they're a diary of uh, the events that are taking place, a diary of everyone's thoughts in today's um, uh, Zoom cast. And I think this, this will be a, a very much a reference point, as Susanna said, that we do not lose some of these uh, innovative thoughts. And as Sue was saying, bringing those into your thinking and how to expand on those and look at new opportunities for sale. So I think these um, Zoom casts that we're doing, Victor, will be a very good diary of uh, this period. Fantastic. Um, Sue, what will be your keepsake, your souvenir of the pandemic? I think um, I've always been big on systems thinking and collaboration and coming together to join lots of dots. In fact, if I look at Rosemary's background, it's kind of inspiring me to uh, think about the interconnectivity of everyone and how whilst apart, we've actually come closer together. And I think while we're physically distanced, we've been able to come closer together to listen to each other, to hear each other out and to actually find a pathway forward. So I'm very hopeful, I'm very optimistic that the goodness of people uh, about how we are all in this together, we'll come together to find a better pathway forward and a better world for us. That's what I'm hoping to take out of this. Susanna, what's your keepsake, your souvenir from the pandemic? So mine is slightly different. I wrote it down because it just came to my head. So we danced, we laughed, we tried new things and made this world a better place. <laughs> because so, that's what we've been doing. <laughs> we can all, all use the applaud sign. Rosemary, what's your souvenir? Um, people, basically. I, I think, if anything, we, we, we're finding out just how important every person in our life actually is. Um, you know, everyone from uh, the barista through to the people who who uh, are the cleaners in the, in the shopping centres, through to you, you name it. Absolutely everyone needs someone else to know that they matter. Mm. And it's kind of nice that that I know, I mean, I, I just put that, that background behind me and Sue's already picked up that, you know, it's, it's a connection. Um, but it is, it's about being that connection. It's about being a resource, a willing resource. Um, and sometimes willing resource is just someone who's just going to sit there and listen. Mm -hmm. and, and offer a different point of view because the one thing I, I do know about my entire life is that not every person in my industry, whichever industry I'm working in, has the complete set of knowledge that's, that, that is needed. We, we actually have to share it. Mm -hmm. so I think people's going to be the, the one thing I'm going to insist that my grandchildren who range from in age from seven months to 19 years old, I'm going to insist that they actually reach out and understand that they need others, not just their immediate mm. circle of, of friends. Jens, your takeaway, your keepsake. Um, I'm with Rosemary. I haven't seen a barista in ages, but um, 
I've seen other people and if nothing else, we, we do a weekly curbside meeting with our neighbors and um, socially distance, of course, but so everybody stays in their driveway. There's a lot of yelling, but it's fun. But yeah, I've never met so many neighbors and we never felt so connected in the neighborhood. And and, and the same on, the, on a business level, so many people we meet that are that I feel are more open now than ever before because everybody's looking for contact. Everybody's looking for purpose. Everybody's looking for that glimpse of optimism. And so, um, yeah, if, 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 if I'm taking this with me and I hope a lot of people will do that too. So if, if nothing else, and if we can keep some of that uh, beyond this crisis, that will be awesome. Amanda. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think that what's been really fascinating about this is that this is like a global crisis. Everybody is in this. And, you know, taking off what Rosemary said, it's, it's about everybody. It's the least of us. You know, it, it, we can't move forward from this until everybody moves forward. Right? You have one person in the community who has this and, and the whole thing starts over again. So, so that's, I, to me, that's the real sea change. I, I think, you know, the world was really in a place where there's a lot of winners and losers, so to speak. Uh, I think that's gone away. I think that's, it's, it's a much more understanding that, you know, everybody matters and everybody has to move forward together or it's not going to work. Brilliant. Vincenzo. Yes, pretty much. I agree with, um, with the human, human uh, connection theme. And, but not just for people that are around us. What I, I my, my one, my focus is it's family because in this period I have been connected with my family as more than any any times because I spend my day out all day a normal period normal time my wife work I work I work we we, we met a couple of hours in the evening prepare dinner go to bed and then day after we leave and we message each other we have been living together we have been having a family experience finally at last in the last couple of months and also with my daughter I've been spending time with my daughter as I had never done before so, yeah, human connection and family, family, family time. Brilliant. Sam, the soap? No, I've got a little bit of all of those things. I'm, I have to say on the family front, my, I'm very excited because I feel like I've waited seven years for my eldest child to actually, because he's such a social butterfly, to be stationary enough to work on my house. And I have been literally from dawn till dusk working. And it means I've got somebody to physically do the things that makes it possible for me. So I've been very excited because I've been into all of this massive house I've lived in for a ridiculously long length of time. Um, but on the, the more optimistic side of uh, manufacturing, um, I'm sort of excited by the possibility that we can maybe, if it lasts longer, actually think about investing in local things. Because I, I happen to get into this unusual group of men in their 80s, this very small Victorian manufacturing group. And they are uh, have been two or three generations manufacturing things and they're used to reiterating and I was like what are you making like they make these most bizarre bits and pieces for the whole planet and they can retool and redo things and and nobody knows about them and there's probably 30 or 40 of them and they're incredibly wealthy three or four hundred thousand turnover a year like they're very very facile and I, I was trying to get them to do a bit more publicity because everyone's always saying manufacturing is dead in Australia, but in fact, it's really not. Um, but we don't know about it. And it's these sort of Zooms. I've been getting into connections with people I would I just would never get into. And I love networking. But, you know, there's, there's only just so... You don't get to stand and listen to people's conversations. So in, in a group like this... You get into intimate conversations that I would never get access to. So I love it because I can go, oh, they haven't thought about that. Oh, and I could put a little thing in the chat and either take it or they don't. But, you know, like I'm talking to people in soil and people in, you know, um, the Middle East doing oil trade and like, huge investment stuff and like literally in so many different areas all over the planet. And I find it exciting that I'm able to access these because in zoom they're letting me do it for free i don't have to spend you know four thousand dollars and accommodation and all that stuff i can't afford to do and I, i've been like oh i can get into these really like sometimes they're just random i get into them and they're really high level and i'm talking to ministers and people i never get to talk to i'm like i'm i'm excited about it because it's like having 
access to things that you don't normally get access to. Brilliant, Sam. So the last word, Sue, Susanna and Robert to wind up. Well, Sue? Go, Rob. Yeah, no, Sue you go. first. Rob's going to do the thank yous. Oh, OK. Oh, I, I just want people to embrace their curiosity, their inner ethical salesperson, and start getting out there to uncover and unearth opportunities and look at how they can serve people the best way possible with their talent and capabilities. So everybody lives by selling something. Get out there. Susanna? Just look at this uh, moment in time as a great opportunity to connect um, and reinvent yourself. And Rob okay. Masters, can I ask you to end the webinar? Yes, and on behalf of uh, Victor and, and the centre, Sue and Susanna, thank you very much uh, for your insights this afternoon, but also to all the participants, thank you very much. Very interesting questions, and I'm sure a lot of the Everyone who sees this will take a lot out of it. So thank you very much to the both of you and to everyone else. Yeah. Thank you.